everybody and welcome to the channel. In today's archive video, we have Bill Dovendeck and Donna Woodwell presenting on the dark side of the moon, the lunar apsides and the story of Lilith with some fascinating famous chart examples. If you would like to reveal where Lilith is located in your chart, please let us know in the comments below. Coming up, we have a number of fantastic workshops and webinars. So if you'd like to learn more, please visit Kepler College. Dot org. And lastly, coming up in February, we have our Leaders in Astrology series. I'll be interviewing Rick Levine and other legendary astrologers. So without further ado, let's get into the video. Welcome to today's webinar. What we're going to talk about are things you may not have thought about before. And I certainly knew nothing about it when I started doing this kind of research. And, you know, those of you who've been to a lot of my webinars know that I have this tendency to find things that I know nothing about and then spend a lot of time figuring out what they are and how they work and then put them in a way that I can explain it to other people because I think they're so cool. The lunar absides were one of those things because um, what, the more I looked, the more I was fascinated by the moon, how it moves, and what we could do with this in astrology, and who else has done things with it. So we're going to talk about what the lunar apsides are today, and I guarantee you, when you get done this presentation, if you don't think they're as important as the moon's nodes, I did not do my job, and neither did Bill. When did we start calling these special points in a chart, Lilith, and the perigee point, um, the perigee point Priapus, what's the mythology of Lilith and her friends? Do these interpretations that we've grafted on actually make sense in real charts? And maybe, going further, what's the best way to use these positions in your own interpretation? But we're going to start with the very basics, what is the moon, and go forward from there and build one concept on another so that we're all on the same page by the time we get to the Lilith stuff. Okay, so the astrological moon. A traditional sense, the moon, in a, in a way, is essential yin. If the sun is yang, then the moon is a yin planet. Verbs that have been associated with it are to gather and receive, because all of it does is collect the light from the sun and reflect it back to us. It's also about nourishing and protecting. If we had no moon, there would be no us. And everybody knows if there's no sun, there'd be no life on Earth. That's a given. But it's also true that if we didn't have the moon, life on Earth would be much harder to evolve because what the moon does for us is it stabilizes our planetary orbit so the poles aren't shifting around all over the place and gives us the long geological periods that it takes for life to actually evolve. And so we've got to be grateful for Mama Moon. Um, it's always changing from night to night, so it's about change and growth and diminishing. Um, it's also the dark side of our minds. You know, um, Bill and I were talking about it, that in Vedic astrology, the moon has a lot to do with the mind space. Not, where, not the thoughts themselves, but the space that thought is happening in. So that's all kinds of things like unconsciousness and sleep and memory or, or our habits, our emotions, altered states of awareness or even insanity. Am I missing anything, Bill? No, you pretty much got everything. The only thing I would uh, put on that as well is that the moon's the day-to-day -day life. So it ties into the fact that a lot of people go through life on a day-to-day -day basis in a very unconscious way. I also think it's worth mentioning that if you were talking to a Vedic astrologer in India, and they asked you what your sign was, your answer would be your moon sign, not your sun sign. Absolutely. So let's talk about how the moon moves. I'm going to take a step back to ancient times for a minute. The ancients believed all orbits were circular because the planets represented a kind of avatar of divine, divine states. They were closer to the heavens and, and the Godhead than we were. And so, ergo, they must be moving in circles because that was the ultimate symbol of the divine. Except, once we started having more sophisticated science, we recognized that orbits weren't actually circular. And this is where we get the laws of motion, Kepler's laws of motion, you know, the same Kepler that Kepler College is named after. Kepler demonstrated mathematically that all orbits are what's called ellipses and not actual circles. Now, what an ellipsis is, 
is kind of a squash circle, which is drawn around two focal points in the center. So if you can imagine, you know, taking uh, two nails and sticking them in a board and tying a string between them, which is what this is a picture of, and then using that and putting a pencil in the middle and drawing the ellipses around it, that's mathematically what an ellipsis is. But it's also the way bodies orbit each other. So here's a picture of Kepler's second law of motion, which is that any thing orbiting will always sweep out equal areas in equal times. That basically means, if you can see this picture here that's moving around on the, on the screen, that when bodies are farther away from what they're orbiting, they go slower. And when they're closer to what they're orbiting, they go faster, as you can see here. Um, another way to translate it might be if anybody's gone skating, especially ice skating, you've seen an ice skater with their arms outstretched. They're going slower and to go faster and faster, they pull their arms in and hold them to themselves. I can use this analogy because I used to be one of those little, those little Dorothy Hamill wannabes when I was a kid. So we all know what that feeling is to come closer to something and go faster. They use this also all the time in um, when we send probes to other planets. We use this factor to make the probe go, like get a sort of gravity assisted boost and get it to go to a place where we're trying to send it even faster by slingshotting it around, say, Jupiter or something. Okay? So this is just astronomy and astrophysics 101. When Plan, when, let's, let's just talk about the moon now. So when the moon is near its perigee point, that's the place where it's closest to the Earth, and that's what the word perigee means, close to Earth, perigee, um, we have what's called a supermoon. And you might be familiar with the term supermoon because Richard Knoll, who coined the term, is one of the first astrologer, well, actually the first astrologer to get a word moved into the formal science -y astronomy world since Kepler, technically. So a supermoon, when we see it in the sky, is about 14% larger and 30% brighter than an ordinary moon, at least at the middle latitudes. The pair of a supermoon is a micromoon. That's when the moon is near, full moon is near the apogee point. And the apogee is when it's farther away because apo means far and g means earth. So here's a picture of the relative sizes of both of them. Another term you've heard, which is related to this phenomenon, is um, the total and annular eclipses. When we have a total solar eclipse, that just means that the um, new moon is closer to the moon's perigee point because it makes the moon physically bigger and can cover up more of the sun. When we are having an annular eclipse, that's a new moon, which is, close, which is closer to the apogee point, the moon is physically sm looks physically smaller in the sky and can cover up less of the sun, and so you get that ring of fire around the sun. It's a much, the sky doesn't go completely dark the way it does in the solar eclipse. You might have run across in your astrological training people talking about um, whether the moon is fast or slow. This is another manifestation of this fact that, that, that orbits have points where they are closer to, to what they're orbiting and farther away from what they're orbiting. So in the case of the moon, um, especially if you've learned astrology, oh, anything earlier than like the 1950s, this was a common thing to talk about, whether, and the effect that it had on, the, on how you would interpret someone's moon. So a, on average, the moon moves approximately 13 degrees per day, okay? So that's, but the thing is that because it's, its speed is constantly changing, a slow moon is, oh, 11 or 12 degrees a day versus a fast moon, which is 14 or 15 degrees a day. They consider that slow moon made your mind more deliberate. Uh, it took its time thinking things through, but when it came to a decision, it was like, okay, I've got the right answer. A fast moon had a sense of being alert and open to all kinds of stimulus and processing it really quickly. 
Um, so they each had their pluses and minuses. A lot of times they would use these in conjunction with where Mercury was because that was the thoughts themselves, whereas the moon was the space which was doing the processing of the thoughts. So this line of absides, and it's absides, it reminds with ephemerides. I had to look it up when I was first looking because it looks like absides, right, or absides, but it's absides. It's the line that connects the closest point to a planet and the farthest away point from the planet, as we've said already. Um, in the case of the moon, these are the apogee and perigee points. But every planet also has these points. So Venus has a line of absides. Mars has a line of absides. Neptune has a line of absides. Every single planet. Um, but in the case of the planets, it's perihelion close to the sun aphelion, farthest away from the sun. For the Earth, we are at our perihelion approximately in January, and we are at our aphelion approximately in July. So all, all planets go through this, and if you are an astronomer and you are describing an orbit, the two points that are most important in how you would describe that orbit to other astronomers are the planet's nodes, or the lunar nodes in the case of the moon, and the line of absides. That's how they describe orbits. So in astrology, the fact that we are only using the nodes and not the absides is not what the astronomers do. We have been using this line of absides pretty much as long as astrology has been around because we needed it to know when supermoons were going to happen so we could predict tides. We needed it to be able to predict eclipses. The Antikythera mechanism, which was one of the oldest existing astronomical slash astrological calculators, actually calculates the line of absides. So this has been around for a really, really long time. This is not something that we're just discovering now. We've known about it since we've been looking up at the sky and making observations. Okay, like the nodes, we already know that the, the nodes, you're probably familiar, move around the zodiac called nodal precession over about 18 and a half years. That's why eclipses happen in different places through the course of that 18-year um, cycle. They process backwards. So right now the, the nodes are in, the north nodes in Leo, and the next round of eclipses, once they get the Leo Aquarius ones done, will back up, and they will go into Cancer and Capricorn and so on through the years. The absides also process. And the reason that they process, the reason they move through the zodiac is because they're constantly being pulled by the dynamic between uh, moon and sun, and they force them to kind of shift in their rotation. And here's a couple pictures. It's actually easier to see when you um, can see it illustrated of what it actually looks like. So if you can just imagine that far away point, um, moving against the background of the stars, that means it moves in the zodiac. Okay? All of this is part of a phenomenon known as the anomalistic month. If you're familiar with the moon, you know there's a lot of different ways to describe a month. Month coming from the word moon. We know that there's a um, uh, the months that has to do the what, more familiar lunation cycle where it moves from a new moon to another new moon and we're all we all know how that works because we see it happening from night to night there's also the sidereal month and the sidereal month is when the from when the moon from moves from one specific star in the sky all the way around to the next specific star in the sky um, now, the, uh, the lunation, new moon to new moon, takes about 29 days. But the sidereal month only takes about 27 days, simply because as the moon is going around the Earth, the Earth is continuing to move around the sun. And so the moon kind of has to race to catch up. So, so one, one cycle takes a little longer than the other. Well, there are several other cycles that 
fit into this equation, and one of them is what's called the anomalistic month. And the anomalistic month is absolutely fascinating because, it, well, it's perigee to perigee, but unlike some of the other cycles, it's not consistent. Because of this wobble and the perigee and how strange it is, and it's always shifting. So they call it an anomalistic month because, well, you know what the word anomaly means, something out of the usual, something out of the ordinary, something strange. And the anomalistic month, perigee to perigee, actually changes from like slightly over 24 days to just shy of 29 days. Now think about it. What it, Can you conceive of a definition of month, an astro astronomical month, that has such a wide variation? You know, what happens if like, you know, instead of ha seeing the moon go from full to full every 28 days and change, um, it was like 24 versus 29. That's a really wide space of time. And once I realized that all of this has to do with what we would observe as something strange, something, something that you could never predict, something that doesn't follow the rules, I think that's a clue to where we can start developing a theory uh, about what these points might mean in a chart. And I'm a big advocate of what it looks like in the sky is a reflection of what we end up interpreting it in our astrology. So let's take that little astronomical view of it as we go forward and start looking at the mythology of where we got these things from. So I'm going to turn over the presentation to Bill as we talk through um, how we got names for these points. The earliest information that we have for our current understanding of this is from the astrologer Safariel, who was also a theosophist. He uh, spent a lot of time with Madame Blavatsky in the 19th century, even up until the time that she died. And he was the originator for this information. Now, he didn't necessarily give us the technical terms that we use now. As you can see on the screen, he referred to the hypothetical second moon as Lilith as reference to theosophical and Kabbalistic liter uh, literature. Now, let's take a moment to describe that because in order to understand this, we have to know what was going on, spiritually speaking, in the 19th century. In short, we had the early stirrings of Egyptology. We also had the first translations of the baked clay tablets from ancient Sumeria. We had uh, gentleman by the name of Francis Barrett who wrote a book called The Magus that was a huge hit in London in 1801. In France, and this is kind of key in the bigger picture, in France we had what's called the French Occult Revival, and a lot of that focused on Eliphas Levi. Now, in addition to all this, we had Madame Blavatsky, who was a Ro Russian noblewoman, and she spent more resources than I care to think about exploring India, Eastern Europe, Europe in general, seeking the underlying spiritual truth of the Western esoteric tradition. Uh, for those of you that are not aware, her book, The Secret Doctrine, has been very influential in key points in history since then. But I give you a warning, it's better used as a reference rather than reading it for a bedtime story. <laughs> <laughs> now, she's considered the mother of the new age or the mother, mother of metaphysics because she brought us yoga, she brought us chakras, she brought us Buddhism, she brought us ceremonial magic. Uh, pretty much, if it's an idea that didn't originate in Europe, we can trace this all back to her. Now, that's only one part of the equation because she started a society called the Theosophical Society. And their motto is, there is no, uh, basically, there is nothing greater than truth. And 
this was an interesting society. It still exists today in four different branches, but she put out a magazine at the time called Lucifer. And this is key to know because a lot of prominent uh, cultists got their start with essays and magazines in Lucifer. And you can imagine if somebody put out a magazine today, the uproar that the title alone would cause. And that starts to lead us down this rabbit hole a little bit deeper because at the time, Lucifer was being reviewed as seen as an angel of light, the light bearer, rather than a lot of the dogmatic propaganda correspondences that had to do with him at the time. This was indicative of what was going on in Europe, and it showed the greater occult movement in action. Now, part of this century also involved Kabbalistic explorations, and here we get our first mentions and ideas having to do with Lilith in a modern context. Lilith is said to be the queen of the night side of the Tree of Life. For those of you that are familiar with the Kabbalah, she would, uh, in traditional thought, correspond to Malkuth, or the physical world that we live in. So, as you can see, with regards to Safariel, there was a lot going on, and he touched into the zeitgeist of the times. Now, also, as you can see on the slide on your screen, French astrologer Dom Narrowman first gave the name Black Moon, Black Moon Lilith to the lunar apogee point in 1937. So, if you connect the dots, linearly speaking, You've got Safariel several decades before getting the ball rolling, and then you have Naroman actually giving it a little more structure and codification. And this is the, to the um, one who had the question about why Black Moon Lilith is in a French um, ephemeris. It's because that Black Moon Lilith night was, was named by a French astrologer, and it's been a part of the French tradition in astrology um, since that point in time. Yeah, and I think that's important to note because now with the information I just shared, we have context. It wasn't like this French astrologer uh, was sitting around and just had a, uh, you know, a wild hair to say, hey, let's name it Lilith. It was in vogue and established at the time, which I find very, very fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, that's you know, what we'll be talking about today in where we come up with these astrological ideas. So, Bill, tell us about Lilith. You're one of the experts. Uh, well, I'm flattered, but I wouldn't call myself an expert. I just work with her a lot. Uh, so, <laughs> anyway, yeah, let's talk about Lilith because there is a lot out there about her. Some of it is clear and easy to understand, and some of it is not. According to the oldest traditions, Lilith was the first wife of Adam. She was the one that was created as a companion for Adam. However, as the legend goes, uh, basically when they went to have sex, she wanted to be on top. So she wanted to be his equal rotating the roles. Adam basically did what you would expect a prepubescent boy to do and threw a fit and she still didn't submit and eventually that led to her getting kicked out of the Garden of Eden. But then again, if you don't like the idea of her getting kicked out of the Garden of Eden, don't worry. There's another Kabbalistic tale that says she left of her own accord and she basically said, you're going to force me to submit. I will stand to defy you because I am an equal to Adam. Now, another variation on that myth, which is a great segue for the next point, is in some Kabbalistic texts, it said that she was not given the breath of life, as it were. I find that fascinating because she was still autonomous and conscious. So when she left Eden, she became the mother of monsters. I think that's something profound because basically it reminds me of a phrase that I learned in my youth, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. And basically 
Lilith said, well, if you're standing against me or trying to make me submit, then I will stand against you with all the powers I can muster. And being a woman, I can give birth to monsters. And that is exactly what she did. In a lot of circles, she is known as the queen of monsters or the mother of monsters or the makers of monsters. And her entire existence was number one, standing in her own personal power, and number two, standing against the storm cult of Yahweh. So as you can see, just with those couple minutes alone, not only is there a lot of information, but there's several different myths. So you've kind of got to look at the whole picture when you look at her. Fast forward up until the time of the really heavy-duty, hardcore, Kabbalistic writings in the medieval ages, and there's a, a slight resurgence of interest in Lilith, but they put emphasis on her more monstrous demonic side. So they talk about her as a succubus or the mother of succubi. Now, fast forward again, we already discussed how it was being received and worked with in France a few centuries later, but let's bring it up to contemporary times. I remember in the 1990s, there was a music festival that got started called Lilith Fair. And the first time that I ever heard that title, I thought, well, that's gutsy. And then I researched <laughs> how they were working with her, and I realized it was absolutely brilliant. You see, Lilith is that unbridled, untamed, raw, feminine power. She supplicates to no one. She's either an equal or she's not there. And she stands against oppression. Now, what's really fun to consider is the fact that current we currently we live in a solar phallic patriarchal paradigm. So what I've enjoyed over the last several years is the fact that the more we move into the century and the closer we get to the age of Aquarius, the more she is coming back front and center because it shows that there is a balancing that is happening to restore the matriarchy that was in place before the patriarchy. And Lilith is a wonderful example of that because she is the primal woman in a lot of ways. She is the confident woman. She is, uh, uh, for those of you that may know the term, she is the femdom. It's her way, and if she doesn't like it, then she'll just leave. But she won't forget. Spooky, isn't it? <laughs> this is a well-timed presentation. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> You can see a lot of the story there on the current slide. Uh, and I think this is very fascinating to look at because it is a tragedy. Uh, much like the greatest of angels, she was punished for searching for equality. And it was being punished for basically following her honor code. So that's the tragedy, but the rise to power is the fact that she stepped outside of Yahweh's creation and founded her own. So that's the rise to power. I really enjoy that part of her story because it's the kind of ultimate screw you to authority. <laughs> now, once she left the Garden of Eden, there were three angels that were charged with making her return. And here again, you get multiple versions on the same myth. But in short, the way that this worked out is even the angels couldn't get her to submit. So eventually, an arrangement was made with God. And it was a punishment and a blessing. On one hand, part of it was that she was to give birth to 100 babies a day, only to watch them all be slaughtered. But the other part of the myth was that she would give birth to a hundred monsters or demons. So you get this idea of using a woman's motherhood or her body against her, but in the version of Lilith and in the story, you get this idea that she just doesn't care because she knows she's right, and quite honest, honestly, uh, karmic law and metaphysics say that she will always be victorious. So wherever she is in your chart, it's a strongly feminine chart point, and it has to do with tragedy and rise to power. 
the feminist side that we are has to do with the power play of dominance and submission. The interpretation of this can be as internal or external as much as the person desires. So in that way, she's very, very motherly, but not the kind of mother that you would associate with the astrological sign of cancer. She's more the, 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 the dark mother, the hard mother. She's the one who will enact what seems to be very harsh punishments, but in reality are blessings in disguise. So a lot of times she's the tough love woman. Where, where it's at in your chart can tell you a lot about where you should exercise tough love. And let's face facts. If you're exercising tough love, then the first person to exercise tough love with is the self. But she also represents the hidden. She's our fetish, our guilty pleasure, our dirty secret. She is a wonderful patron deity for women that have been slighted or wronged in any way, shape, or form. As a matter of fact, a more recent development on this is the idea that Lilith is really kind of encroaching on her zenith point for publicity and power in recent history, and along with her rise to consciousness in the public eye, we have sex scandals coming up in the media. So we can see that her, the energy that she is getting from people and the way people want to work with her as a champion is paying dividends in a very real concrete way in society. And of course, there is the more Amazonian trait. She is the stance against the patriarchy. She will not yield until true equality is reached. So you might have thought it was just one little point in your chart, but no, <laughs> it's a lot deeper than that. And as we said, Lilith is the name that we have given in the early part of the 20th century, late part of the 19th century, to the lunar apogee. But like the nodes, they're a pair of points. They're not one point, they're a pair. And so why name one without naming the other? Which is an excellent be question. Before you get to there, yeah. I just wanted to note there are a couple of, of comments um, which <laughs> in this short, short webinar, obviously you don't have time to go into some of the fullness of the myths or even some of the early mythic, earlier than the Christian tradition myths that they're noting that they, they exist out there. Um, but maybe I can just drop a, an, an idea in the two of you that perhaps we at some point do another one where it's all on the mythologies. Oh, we could easily we could easily fill a, <laughs> a two-hour webinar on just Lilith alone. Or a workshop. Yeah, or a okay. workshop. And, and still, after that two-hour block, we would have only talked about maybe... 40% of her. It's a really complex figure when you look at it from an occult perspective. And she has so many layers to her. It's just amazing. This okay. is why you go get experts on subject matter experts when you have these conversations. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so back to the fact that the apodes, I mean, the, the apsides are a pair of points. And here's a picture of when Safario was talking about the um, naming the second moon, um, a lot of uh, a French astronomer in the mid-1800s, about 1850 or so, there were lots of planet hunters going on around at this point because we had come up, we, um, William Herschel had discovered um, Uranus and then they had just discovered Neptune and everyone's like, oh, oh, I want to discover a planet too. And so they were looking for all kinds of other things and there were asteroids that were coming up in the equation. And so there was a French astronomer um, out of Toulouse University who w was determined to find a second moon that the moon must have, uh, that the earth must have at least two, and this empty focal point was one of the places that they were looking for it. Um, so Fariel named this focal point Lilith because it was so, as Phil had talked about, so in vogue at that point in time. And 
the apogee point just happens to be in a direct line from that second point. So that's what Narrowman was talking about when he named it Lilith. But then we still have the second point over here that we've been ignoring. So, of course, eventually someone comes up with some other ideas about what this partner for Lilith would be. So let's play the Lilith dating game for a few moments here and see some suggestions on what this partner for Lilith might look like. So Bill, I'm going to turn it back to you. Okay, so let's start with the actual name as it exists in the common vernacular right now. Uh, Priapus, Priapus, however you want to pronounce it, is the name that was given to that counterpoint. And it was named in 1998 by a German astrologer as Lilith's release point. So the character of Priapus is a minor Greek fertility god that also corresponded to the male genitalia. No, that's not a rash he has. That was intended by the artist. So what you get right off the bat is you do get this idea that if she's the dark feminine, then the masculine life giver would be the opposite energy. So the energy and the concept matches. However, does Priapus connect with Lilith in myth and legend? No. No, 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 no. Could you work with them in a similar fashion, uh, magically or psycho-spiritually speaking? Yes. Are they from the same pantheon? No. Would it have been common for people to be familiar with both of them at the time of the Greek pantheon? No. Did it happen? Probably. So then the idea of masculine fertility being an offset point or a release point for Lilith works but this particular character doesn't. And now we come to the real racy stuff. If you think this has been racy so far, hold <laughs> on to your hats. Because according to Kabbalistic legend, the counterpoint, the other part of Lilith, is the angel Samael. Now, Samael is a fascinating character. We could do a workshop just on Samael alone as well and perhaps we will on down the road in the esoteric studies department. But according to tradition, Samael is the counterpart of Lilith. Samael was one of the original, if not the original, angel of death when you look back into the Abrahamic belief system and its roots. His name translates to poison of God or venom of God. And here we, we first get our uh, spidey senses going off. Because Samael is an angel of death, but his name translates to poison of God, implying that it's kind of like when you get a flu shot, you get injected with a sickness to build up an immunity against it. That's kind of similar to him. And the reason I use that parallel is because in some other traditions, he's seen as a fallen angel. But by some early theologians and Kabbalistic writers, they even went so far as to say that he's a double agent. Yes, he's a fallen angel, but he's the poison of God in the realms of evil and in the realms of the devil. Now, I find all of this hysterical because if you read between the lines, the only reason you would put that caveat on there about Samael being a double agent is because there's such a mass popularity for his character that you need to give masses of people something so they don't feel like the church has rejected one of their major characters. And you know, let's say I'm wrong about that theory. It does open up the line of logic that they had to pacify a person or particular groups of people to say Samael is a double agent. Or maybe there's something else fishy going on. And the reason that I point these questions out is because it's very similar to Lilith in that there is this shadow and mystique around Samael. But let's put it against the same critical thinking question that we used a few minutes ago. Does Samael connect with Lilith in myth and legend? Yes, emphatically yes. It said the union of Samael and Lilith will bring the end of the world. Now let's look at this from an astrological perspective. 
let's look at the fact that we've already talked about the Lilith point. Now let's look at the release point. Basically, if we look at it in this modern logical context, then we see that Lilith is one spot. If you go with Samael, then Sa Samael would be the other. And the idea that Lilith and Samael merging into one, bringing about the end of the world, is really just a beautiful uh, metaphor for the idea that when you harmonize those two strong energies within yourself, you will achieve personal power. Yeah, I always like looking at things like that. I've got a bunch of oppositions in my chart, and I always say it's like a teeter-totter. you got to find the exact spot in the middle to straddle so that everything's balanced, because if you get too heavy one way or another, you, it messes you up. And it's kind of the same thing here with this relationship. And you said Lilith and straddling, and I had to laugh. <laughs> it's because she chooses to. <laughs> no. And now let's, let's bring it a little uh, forward here. Uh, let's enter Lucifer into the equation. This is why I went out of my way earlier to mention about Blavatsky's magazine, Lucifer. If you look at the Latin word Lucifer, it translates to light bearer. So it's actually not a name, it's a title. If you look back in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, you find the one sentence in the Bible that he's referenced, and he's not even called Lucifer, he's called Hallel, which is a title for an older god that I wrote uh, about in my, uh, one of my books, Awakening Lucifer. So it's a horrid story of mistranslation, and the problem is there's been billions of people that have believe this idea that Lucifer is the devil for thousands of years now. So there's this massive scar in the collective consciousness of the human species that says Lucifer is evil. But if you look at the oldest stories of Lucifer, he was the greatest and brightest of angels, and he was cast out of heaven for, guess what? That's right, you guessed it, for seeking equality. He loved God so much, he wanted to be equal to God, and God said no. And as a matter of fact, God just didn't say no, he kicked him out. Now, some stories will say it was ego or pride. So here's another example of myths, what's true and what's not. And quite honestly, a lot of it conflicts. But if you look back at older texts, does he connect with Lilith in myth and legend? In a strictly Kabbalistic sense, not so much. However, in recent times, with an increased study and curiosity about the Clifoth, which I am not going to even touch here today, other than to say it's the uh, backside of the Tree of Life, there is more and more emphasis that it is either Lilith and Samael that are the two primary deities of that path, or it's Lilith and Lucifer that are the two primary deities of that path. And this is very fascinating because he is a lord of light and she is a mother of darkness. He sought equality. She sought equality. They're both rogues and kicked out because they wanted equality and justice. So for anybody that's been marginalized, this is a fantastic pair to work with. The other reason it's very interesting and profound to put it in this presentation is because it also shows how names and concepts evolve over time, especially in a contemporary setting. If you look at a lot of astrology historically, Donna mentioned this earlier, when astrologers name things, they look around at what's going on in the world at the time, and they do their best to use names that capture the zeitgeist of the era going forward for posterity. Now, uh, the reason this is interesting is because not only is Lucifer being looked at in a new light ever since Blavatsky brought him back up in the mass consciousness, there's also a TV show about Lucifer. I have seen clips on YouTube that are genuine of the Pope using the title Lucifer in the Mass because it's a Mass in Latin and the title has been used as a name for Jesus. And I find this quite fascinating because just like I mentioned earlier about Lilith being at the forefront 
of all the changes going on in society with the restoration of feminine power, Lucifer is also coming into the spotlight to be restored as well, but his is a path of illumination. Uh, one of the phrases my students have heard me say many times throughout the years is that if you want to work with the light, you got to be ready to burn. So yeah. let's bring it back to the dating game. How do yeah. you choose your partner? Yeah. This is an excellent question of how astrological concepts are made. So, Because this is a perfect example. Um, how do we come up with these ideas and spread them through community? For example, um, the naming of Priapus was one perhaps lovely German astrologer less than 20 years ago. And it's not like the astrology community is excessively professionalized, not like we have a formalized research arm. It's not like people are doing lots of studies and finding uh, chart correlations in a sophisticated, documented way. We just got a new idea and people started repeating it and you got to ask the question, how do we know it's true? I mean, heck, Bill and I are here proposing something new that no one has ever done before and talking about the opposite, the, the opposite point of Lilith as Lucifer. Does this mean that Bill and I are making astrological history? What do you think, Bill? Well, of course we are. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you, uh, I think you bring up something funny, which, which is just the simple fact that a lot of times people think politics is a popularity contest. Sorry, you're second to astrologers. We've been doing popularity contests for thousands of years. <laughs> and this is a great example of it. Are we, to the fact that we have been given this webinar at Kepler with a wide audience, um, are we going to send a whole bunch of people off to like go searching in their charts for where Lucifer is? I um, hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, this uh, this also brings up an important point, which is that in a, a lot of ways, the underpinnings of astrology will never change, but our perception will, and quite frankly, it should. It's called evolution. And the reason I mention this is if you look at some of these points on the slide, it kind of opens your mind to the creative interpretation and understanding of both those points in your chart. And, you know, I think it's very appropriate to be talking about Lilith and Lucifer and the concept of why are you obeying? Why are you doing just what, what you're told or what someone told you to do? It's our job as astrologers not simply to repeat the common wisdom, but to use, as Bill has said, our critical thinking and our powers of observation to hold up our own lives and our own experience with charts and with other people's charts to see if what we have been told by X, Y, and Z is actually what's in front of us and hence the part of how will you decide to use these points in your chart if you put them in so think about how they fit into your own life and use that profound logic that we have all been gifted with as human beings haven't we doesn't that look like the definition of human pretty really much think well, and I think one of the things that is worth keeping in mind is the fact that the counterpoint to Lilith has not been studied as much. So in a lot of ways, it's a wild, wild west. And what we can do is we can look at the characteristics of, say, Samael or Lucifer and really see not only how they play out in our life, but we can formulate our own list of correspondences based on those characters from myths and stories and see what fits with our experiences and the experiences of others that we might know. We're going to have several examples of charts coming up in the near future, and it's going to be a variety. So, Donna, would you like to kick the next step of the Lilith? Like uh, now, we have a bunch perfect. of them. Because, I mean, I, as I said, 
this is all what we are working through right now. This is the beginning of a research project, and we hope we will inspire some of you to continue this kind of work. Um, I had a little conversation with David Cochran and got my lovely serious software to churn out a bunch of charts that have Lilith either um, with one of the angles of the chart or with the sun or the moon. And as I went through charts, I started adding, I started sensing what this felt like to me and guessing and coming up with some great guesses of additional charts that we have put into this presentation to give you some examples. But of course, we're going to start with Safario because he's the one who named Lilith in the first place. So I said, huh, I wonder where his Lilith is in this chart. And poof, lo and behold. All right, so since we haven't gone over this yet, let me just take a moment to look here. This moon, this dark moon on top of the cross, this is the traditional astrological signature for the black moon Lilith or just plain Lilith. So this is the lunar apogee. The little T here is for the true apogee, meaning it's where it actually is at that particular moment in the sky. Just like the nodes where you can have a true node versus a mean node, a mean is an average. This is where it happens to be at that particular instant. And you can see the opposite, always in an opposite pair. When the crescent moon is on the bottom with the cross on top, we have Lucifer or Priapist or Samael, or depending on how you use it. I'm going to use Lucifer for this presentation because I like Lilith and Lucifer. It's the whole L and L thing, too. Um, and I also continue to laugh as we have the black moon Lilith on the top, and here she's on the bottom. Just saying. <laughs> she likes that. She's just saying. And it makes it easier for all of you to remember. So here is the black moon Lilith conjunct the moon for Safario which seemed appropriate for the man who gave his name to um, this particular point, gave the name to this, what became this particular point in the sky. Isn't that cool? It's okay. great. And I loved, uh, I loved researching Safario for this uh, presentation because Blavatsky did go so far as to call him the astral tramp. Aww. I know, it's a term of endearment. They even lived together until she died in the uh, latter part of the 19th century. So while they may have uh, had character clashes, she was known to have character clashes with a lot of people. And in a lot of ways, I could almost put myself in Safariel's shoes and see Blavatsky as an embodiment of Lilith herself. She was known for having an attitude because she knew that being a woman in that particular time, you had to have an attitude to get anything done. So <laughs> in a lot of ways, these two were a living embodiment of this relationship in the chart. He was also very, uh, he's the one that introduced Alan Leo, Leo the founder of esoteric astrology, to the Theosophical Society. And the reason that that's interesting is because at age 14, Alan Leo had to drop out of school to take care of his family. Now, the reason I point this out is it wasn't like Alan Leo was hanging out at Safariel and Theosophical meetings. They had some kind of encounter out in society in London that brought the two of them together and caught Safario's interest to extend an invite to him. So it kind of shows how this information will spread too. When you begin working with these uh, points in your charts, watch for random encounters. Watch for it manifesting in a particular life area of the house, but it's probably going to be unexpected. This is so very cool. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just, I'm, I, I get enamored by these new points, and then I want to put them in every chart. And I've been looking at these in charts for people for years now. Um, but just to touch base on what you said about Safari, I'm feeling like you could like resonate and step into his shoes. Um, he was like known for towering above everyone else. He's like six three or six four. And if you've ever met Bill in person, Bill, exactly how tall are you? Because I was really curious and I forgot to ask. I'm six three. See, there you go. You actually could fit into his shoes because... Probably. <laughs> you, you know what they say about the size of a man's shoe? <laughs> yeah. It's in proper proportion to the size of his feet. <laughs> oh, 
All right, moving along into uh, Diane Keaton. So she was one of the people that came up in the searches from the Sirius software as like the number two on the list for having Lilith conjunct her ascendant, which I thought was an absolutely appropriate for a woman who was known, especially in her younger days, for being cast as the quirky personality. Um, Woody Allen found her, when, when he cast her in Annie Hall, it was because of that avant-garde willingness to dress up in men's clothing as her personal style that made her fit so very well with that particular part. In fact, even more recently, when Vanity Fair came to do a cover spread on Diane Keaton, where she is today, she's one of the few people that actually said, I'm not going to let a designer pick my clothes. I'm wearing my own. And so this is the picture, the cover shot from Vanity Fair, um, where she's wearing her own very unique, eclectic collection of clothing and to showing the world because she insists on doing it her own way, which seemed like a very Lilith way to encounter the world to me, appropriate for someone who has Lilith conjunct her ascendant. So Venus Williams also came up high. She also, see here's Lilith, conjunct her ascendant, with Pluto not far behind. She is one of the world's leading female tennis players. And, of course, she is known for her uh, continuing um, competition with her uh, sister, Serena. Uh, but, and I thought this was amazing when I started getting in and looking at these people's charts and their lives, um, she was so indignant that uh, Wimbledon, which is, you know, the, one of the premier tennis hosts of major international matches, um, had refused to pay women the equal amount to the men. And Wimbledon's argument was, well, men are playing five tournaments and women are only playing four, and so therefore we should pay the men more. And her argument was, what was, we would be happy to pay five. This is your issue. Let us play five and make it all equal. And she took it to a court of opinion, and because the media and everyone else brought this to their attention, um, Wimbledon changed their rules and other major national, international tennis competitions followed suit. So that also seemed like a very Lilith thing. I, we deserve to be equal way of going about things. All right, here, you, Bill, you talk about this one. <laughs> this, this uh, do I have to? No, I'm <laughs> kidding. Uh, Nadia Suleiman. She is uh, better known to people as the Octomom, as Donna introduced me to, because I didn't know her real name until this presentation. Uh, what's interesting about her is that several years ago, she gave birth to octuplets. And after a brief amount of time, they became the longest living octuplets that were known about. So... On the surface, right there alone, you think mother of monsters or producer of babies. She's immediately right there in the discussion. However, what's also interesting is that she had six children before that for a total of 14. So it's really that very Lilith energy of being uh, a very fertile woman and very fertile and productive mother. What got things kind of heated for are two things. The first one is that I believe it was the octuplets were the result of in vitro fertilization. So it brought that process back up because it means that biologically things didn't go as they should. It should have produced one child and it produced eight. And the second thing that came up that was very controversial was that she was on public assistance at the time. And a lot of people had a problem with that because they're saying, you've got all these kids, our taxes are paying for you to be a parent, why don't you do something about your situation? So as you can see, she's more of that mother to the masses or motherly type of Lilith energy. And what I find interesting is that Lilith, yes, it's conjunct or ascendant, but it's in Aquarius. You know, this is not a woman that you could pigeonhole into a particular box or under a particular title. 
this is someone who walks to the beat of her own drummer and just by doing her own individual thing she's challenging a lot of preconceptions and norms of society in the process which is basically how Lilith got her start <laughs> Margaret Cho came up in my searches. Uh, she has over here Moon Kinchunked. Um, oops, this is supposed to be. Um, here, here's Lilith, and here's the Moon. Okay, so Moon Kinchunked Lilith. She is a comedian, an actress, and an activist. She's well known. Uh, I love Margaret Cho. She's one of my favorite comedians. She is so authentic and honest about her life, talks about her uh, bisexuality, her eating disorders. Uh, when she started acting, uh, one of the people that she was working with insisted that she lose weight in order to have a part, and she basically starved herself and created all kinds of kidney problems as a result. Um, and so she's very outspoken about things like substance abuse and women's rights and issues and other provocative topics. Um, and then when you read like the fine print, you know, I discovered that as a teenager she actually worked as a phone sex operator and as a dominatrix before she got really famous. So again, a woman who's challenging all kinds of conventions and stereotypes and refusing to go in the box. And yeah, I like her. Can, can I can I can I be friends with her? Is that allowed? <laughs> I have to wait till she comes to Austin so I can go get a I can go get tickets to go see her. All right, here's another one. Ben Clyburn, a American pianist and child prodigy. He won a very prestigious Tchaikovsky competition in Moscow in 1958 when he was only 23. He's played for every president um, uh, from that moment until the time he died. So Obama was the last one. And again, in the footnotes, sometimes it's the footnotes that are really, really fascinating, um, that he was in a long-time partnership with a mortician. So there's this connection to the, the dead through his partnership. And here we can see that Lilith is not just about women. He's got the moon conjunct Lilith um, in a chart with his hands, you know, male chart. So we wanted to make sure we had both genders represented in this little presentation that we're doing. Um, so of course, this brings in the whole, what is a child prodigy? What does it take to be able to master an art like playing the piano? And the first thing I thought of was, huh, all right, this is a lot of focus and discipline um, that goes with having a moon conjunct Lilith. This is, remember, we talked about the fast moon versus slow moon. He's got a very, very slow moon because the when the moon is conjunct the apogee, it's not moving very fast. There's a lot of deliberation to be able to have extreme focus in these kind of circumstances. So I'm like, who else is a child prodigy in piano? Well, Mozart, right? So I said, okay, hmm, I wonder what Mozart's chart looks like. So there you go. And I went, oh, okay, maybe we're picking up something here because there's Mozart's chart, and his moon is on the opposite side, conjunct the perigee. So his moon is conjunct Lucifer in the sense. And if I remember the movie correctly, you know, Mozart was kind of a playboy and very, very fast mind, constantly riffing on things, but he also was kind of a rock star at his age, correct? Amadeus, I remember the song. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here we have, you know, some indication that this line is creating a certain kind of magnetism and focus that can create some extremely brilliant human beings. Of course, I, let's switch tracks here to the extreme. And here we have Ed Wood. Now, I'm not terribly familiar with all of his work, except that I know that it comes out in the sci-fi and the horror genres. Um, he was considered one, I think he even won an award for being like one of the worst filmmakers of all time. Uh, but he was certainly a character. and. Uh, that horror side of things, that dark side of things is one of his, and, and the dark plus the sex was one of the things that he was known for. And here we have over here, um, where's Lilith? Here's Lilith Moon, here's Lilith Lisa. Oh yeah, he had a Lilith come down to the Ascendant, I mean the Midheaven, sorry about that. I'm getting tired already, it's only been an hour and 20 minutes, <laughs> I'm tired. 
So here's Lilith conjunct his midheaven. Um, so once again, we start seeing Lilith show up in charts of people who are exploring the fringes in some way, or the dark and the um, the darkly sexual in some way. Okay, so we think, all right, Ed Wood had that biopic that came out not that long ago, and who played his part? Well, that would be Johnny Depp. So let's look at Johnny Depp's chart. Okay, and look, look, look. Here is Lucifer conjunct his midheaven. Oh, and even better, the perfect conjunction of Lilith and Neptune. Now, of course, Neptune is all about the um, the place of no boundaries, but it also shows up in the charts of film stars and working with the media. And so playing someone who had, it seems like perfect casting to play someone who had Lilith conjunct their midheaven by someone who had Lilith conjunct Neptune. And again, following the train of thoughts, all right, so if Johnny Depp, who's known for playing slightly quirky characters of his own, because he was in Edward Scissorhands, he was the Matt Hatter, and Al he was in Alice in Wonderland, played um, in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and all kinds of, um, I mean, even, even the, the sort of half-dead, half-alive, what exactly was he doing in the Pirates of the Caribbean? Because, like, they got so many of those movies, they got confused. Yeah, I lost track. I lost track, too. But something that was a little bit odd, that's for sure, um, he well, and I think uh, I think you kind of answered your own question there. He was in that popular series, Pirates, Pirates of the Caribbean, and that's very much ocean-based, sea-based, and his Lilith is conjunct Neptune. Yeah, there's an, like another good one. Wasn't he also in a horror movie that had to do with, like, going down the Seven Seals or the Underworld or something? Yeah, Ninth Gate. Mm -hmm. Ninth Gate, there you go. Um, and... Uh, after Edward Scissorhands for a little while, he was in a re romantic relationship with this woman, Winona Ryder. So Winona is also another one who is known for being, especially in the 90s, a kind of outsider goth girl. She got typecast and was playing things. She was in Beetlejuice. She was in Bram Stoker's Dracula. Um, she was also in The Girl Interrupted with Angelina Jolie. Um, and, of course, today she is playing one of the lead roles in Stranger Things, which is kind of a modern, I don't know what you call Stranger Things. It's like a modern take on the 1980s horror genre. Anyway, it just came out with a new season, so I'm very excited. One of the things, if you read about her, that she um, complains about, which I find really fascinating, is that um, this is her today, and for so long, she continued to be asked to play parts that were younger than her because she does look, even at 43, so much like she did when she was in her early 20s. And she's really happy about playing in Stranger Things where she actually gets to play her age. And so there's another side of these absodies. A lot of these people have a certain kind of intensity and vitality that almost makes them transcend whatever age that they are, because there's so much energy in these points. Continuing the horror theme, we have Vincent Price and um, Mr. Duvendak. I'll give you this one to, this one to you because he's a native. He is. Uh, so Vincent Price is one of the most prolific horror actor, actors of the 20th century. He's pretty much touched about every character you can play and in a number of different historical settings and environments. What's always been fascinating about him is that when he's into character, he's into character. And I don't want to go so far as to say a complete method actor, although he may be. He does take his roles very seriously, but at the same time, he doesn't lose his humor. He doesn't lose his sense of identity. Uh, and this is kind of really kind of evident by the fact that Lilith in this chart for him is near the midheaven, which remember, if you look back at some of these other charts, we've seen that as a reoccurring pattern a few times. But it's also in Sagittarius. And the reason I point this out is that, you know, Sagittarius is the sign of, uh, how should I say, traveling. 
And I choose my words carefully here because he started off in St. Louis. He moved to, uh, you know, to Hollywood and he did the whole acting thing. But even if you look at a lot of his roles, they involve movement of some kind. They involve motion of some kind. And you wouldn't necessarily expect it from him. He was a fairly tall, lanky man, but he had a knack for really kind of nailing particular characters from literature and really kind of left his mark on the cinema in general in much the same way Peter Cushing did. (laughs) And we have Christina Ricci. There's a theme developing here maybe. Christina Ricci has Lilith conjunct Saturn in her first house. She was another one I just checked out because I'm like, oh, wow, we got this horror theme going. And who else gets typecast in these sort of um, intense, uh, iconic roles? And who better than the woman who played um, Wendy, Wednesday Adams um, in the Adams Family movie? And recently, she's been cast as Lily Borden in the Lily, Liz, uh, Lizzie, Lizzie Borden Chronicles. And there you go. She has Lilith conjunct Saturn in her first half. She's also the national spokeswoman for the Rape, Abuse, and Incense National Network, which brings back in that speaking up for the abused and oppressed feminine in the world. Yeah, and what makes her interesting is that uh, Lilith is conjunct Saturn, and she really she started very young with her acting career. So normally Saturn denotes like success later in life or deferred gratification or working hard. And I'm not saying she didn't work hard, but in this case, the Lilith energy offset those particular traits of Saturn. It actually worked to her advantage with this combination. This one's all yours, dude. <laughs> no. This one's so, all yours. I, okay, let's get the story of this. So I was, we were putting these things together, and Bill said, I wonder if there's any occultists. And so, of course, we looked up Mr. Crowley first, and I laughed and laughed and laughed. So for those of you that may not be familiar with Aleister Crowley, he was one of the most prolific, influential occultists of the 21st of the 20th century. Well, you know, it's still early in the 21st, <laughs> and he also this. Well, I got to back up here because the what I'm about to tell you now really gets under the skin of a lot of astrologers, and I love sharing this piece of fact that can be proven with evidence because I like like watching people squirm. It's only outside of your comfort zone that you actually grow. In a lot of ways, he was the father of American astrology. And I know that's a bold assertion. But the reason for this is because when Evangeline Adams was making her mark and really defining what American astrology was in the early uh, years of the 20th century, Aleister Crowley was ghostwriting a lot of her material. This was a court case that just got settled several years ago between his uh, uh, organization, the Ordo Templi Orientis, and the estate of Evangeline Adams. The estate of Ms. Adams had to come out and basically publicly say, yes, he did that. And they had to work with the OTO, as it is known, for copyrights, royalties, uh, permissions to publish, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He was one of the first people to really manipulate the media. It was a newspaper that gave him the title, The Wickedest Man in the World, not himself. He was known for being very flamboyant. He was known for walking to the beat of his own drummer because he was independently wealthy. And he played the media like a fiddle in a lot of ways, laying the groundwork for what we know today Uh, in such characters as Alice Cooper and Marilyn Manson. He was an occultist. He was a chess master. He was one of the early advocates uh, coming out of Victorian England for women's rights. He was a huge proponent, proponent of sexuality, embracing your sexuality, and you should be exploring it. 
were all ideas that he fostered. He believed that women were equal to, if not superior to men. And he, I mean, that that's, that's it in a nutshell. I could go on uh, about <laughs> him for a long time. But if you look at his Lilith, it's absolutely fascinating because it's in Scorpio. So it's that intense, real deep, profound, mysterious, kind of woman and he incorporated a goddess that he called Babylon into his belief system of Thelema. So not only was he living out this idea uh, that we've talked about associated with Lilith and Lucifer, he took it one step further and being an astrologer in that particular time, he was familiar with Safariel's writings because he was a theosophist in his early days. So he would have come across Safariel's writings and he would have known this and worked with it and tapped into it. Now what makes this also fun is that the opposite point, the Lucifer point if you will, is conjunct Pluto. And the reason I say this makes it fun is because he was a very earthy person. He was very much into the sensual, tactile side of life. Uh, up until the, he, he did this in the early part of the 20th century, but up until the mid 1950s, he and his climbing expedition were the ones that got the highest on the K2 mountain, Pakistan, which was one of the tallest, if not the tallest known mountain at the time. My memory uh, escapes me on this but he left his mark there as well as in occultism. So cool. It is. He was an intense guy. And then we follow it up with another intense guy with Galileo Galilei. He was one of the first voices of modern times to say that our model of the solar system should be heliocentric. And this made him a heretic because even when the church who were his supporters said, you know, you might want to dial it down a bit. He basically gave him a screw you kind of attitude and pushed on, which led to him being under house arrest until the end of his life. Uh, if you'll notice, he has Lucifer conjunct the sun. And to me, this is very fascinating because there's a lot of parallels between Prometheus and Lucifer. And in a lot of contexts, the two are seen as different masks of one another or even interchangeable. Now, what he did by being an advocate of a heliocentric perspective of the solar system, he was literally bringing down the light of illumination and the fire of divinity and seeing the bigger picture into mass consciousness. So and he a really Piscean age. Look at this. Yeah, in a Piscean age. I mean, it doesn't get much more intense than that. That's one of the reasons he was persecuted. And this is worth mentioning because as we discussed at the beginning of the slideshow, there is that idea that is tragedy and rise to power. And he is a prime example of that. Okay, now hold in mind, here we have Lucifer, Sun, Conjunct, and, the, and Mercury. When you look at this next chart, Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks has this same grouping here in his own chart. Um, Lucifer, Conjunct the Sun, Conjunct Mercury. So think about some of the characters. He, he was, since Spencer Tracy, he was the first one to win back-to-back -back Oscars. And he won them for um, his roles in the movie Philadelphia and his roles in Forrest Gump, both of which dealt with um, slightly different ways of being human. We had the whole AIDS story, which was revolutionary for when it came out, and such a uh, poignant prediction uh, pr uh, depiction of the AIDS crisis, followed by Forrest Gump, who um, really had a different view on the world, but was so compelling. And as it brought up the whole concept of um, uh, learning disabilities, and yet in a way that um, highlighted uh, the, the benefit of having a different way of seeing the world. And of course, he stars in the kind of a cult classic for um, mass society, The Da Vinci Code, revealing all of these, quote, secrets um, in the pop way that such things are done. Is that, a, is that a politically correct way to talk about The Da Vinci Code? Sure. 
It's all made up anyway. I, uh, yeah, well, you know. Um, <laughs> He was in Apollo 13, and Apollo 13 gave him an appreciation for um, all of the uh, work that NASA and space programs have done. In fact, he went on to create an entire series about space programs, which is interesting. He even did a narrative voiceover for a little little vignette called Galileo Was Right. Um, proving that, a uh, little story about how they proved some of Galileo's experiments by dropping things on the moon. Um, he is one of the third, high, he is the third highest grossing collection of movies of anyone in Hollywood right now. And I think, I think, okay, here's my astrological casting prediction. If someone wrote a really good biography, biography and turned it into a script and could hand it to Tom Hanks, I think he'd be willing to play Galileo and he'd be amazing. Because look at this. Isn't this wouldn't that be great casting? <laughs> yes it would. <laughs> maybe maybe it's someone who knows how Tom Hanks who's listening in could give us um, a suggestion. So those are all the charts that we have. So we just have a couple screens left and we know we're we're not that far over time. Do you see any well, patterns? That we have these? some questions for you <laughs> before you before you give up for the day. <laughs> We're not giving up. We have two slides, and then we will open the floor to questions. Okay. okay. So, what have we learned in looking at these? Well, this is a list that Bill and I came up with together. That working with Lilith indicate people who have a powerful Lilith can indicate people who have a certain kind of intensity, charisma, fascination, or a magnetic appeal. Um, people who are willing to fight the system or challenge the status quo, and people who are known for being quirky, dark, or darkly unusually brilliant in some way. Um, do you have anything else to add while we're here? No, I think you pretty much hit it on the head. So, and that's just with the collection of charts that I pulled um, with a quick survey of Sirius. So this opens the door to a much wider conversation that could be happening, which is, what does it look like in the charts of people, your own charts, the charts of people that you work with, or people who have time to do some real structured research? It's, I think, after just this little review, it's certainly worth doing. Not to mention, it's not just the moon that has these these points. It's every planet in in the solar system. So people who are already talking about the planetary nodes, there's no reason we can't talk about the planetary apsides too as kind of like the dark points for Venus or the dark points or, the, or, or something about the hidden dimension of Mars and Saturn and Jupiter and Neptune and all the rest of them um, as a way to start bringing in a more nuanced understanding of how planetary energies are expressing in our charts. Well, and the second half of that exploration would also include the nodes of the planets. Yes. There are a couple of books coming out on that topic soon, though. I know Good. Uh, Mark Jones has got one, and Maurice Fernandez has been working on it. And I say this is another part that we need to add to the equation, not leave them out anymore. Because um, if, if Lilith and Lucifer are coming back into the equation, shouldn't they be coming back into the equation in astrology, too? Exactly. You think? So, I hope you enjoyed this today. We're going to stay for your questions. Here's how you get in touch with Bill and I if you want to continue this conversation. We are both super easy to find. 